Sure, blasphemy and Sabbath breaking were understandable no-nos for the early settlers in New England. But excessive lace and shiny shoe buckles? The writer H. L. Mencken said a Puritan is someone who has this suspicion that someone somewhere might be enjoying themselves. We've come to the Plymouth and Patuxent Museums, formerly known as the Plymouth Plantation, sort of hoping we'd find stocks or pillories, you know, those symbols of public shame. But director Richard Pickering tells us we're confusing our pilgrims with our Puritans. Puritans were very rigorous in their approach to faith and in the way they wanted to control the neighbors around them. Harsh puritanical law was found up north in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. The pilgrims of Plymouth, by contrast, were a smaller community and more chill. So Plymouth's laws for decades are much more open, much more equitable, but in Massachusetts early on, they begin regulating dancing, card playing, Sabbath breaking. Sure, many of the Bay State's curious laws were cooked up by crotchety old Puritans and early colonials, but not all. Current lawmakers have also been known to frown upon certain frivolities. If the city of Marlboro seems calm and orderly, it might just be because it is a dry town. They check the uh, vehicles on the way into town, um, and we haven't had any crossing the borders in a while. No, not alcohol, squirt guns. In 1988, the city of Marlboro decided it had had enough of young hooligans running wild in the streets and harassing innocent citizens. They banned squirt guns, but Marlboro didn't stop there. The city also cut the cord on silly string after a Labor Day parade that got out of hand. Mayor Arthur Vigent. My understanding is there were some brand new cruises that were purchased from the city and some kids had hit it with silly string and damaged it and uh, damaged the new paint. Something there is in Marlboro that just doesn't love a projectile. Back in the 70s, there was a time when uh, you couldn't buy eggs unless you were over 18 because they were flying all over the place damaging cars. And if eggs seem like small potatoes, in 1982, fines were proposed for the dropping of nuclear or similar bombs within city limits. We don't want them here. It's a problem. If they want to go to one of our neighboring communities, that's okay, but I don't want them bomb bombing Marlboro. Marlboro is not alone in its vigilance. According to dozens of completely unreliable websites like stupidlaws.com and idiotlaws.com, the quaint town of North Andover has a ban on space guns. I couldn't find any direct references in the private holdings that we have here. Caitlin Legacy Ralston of the local historical society can't find any trace of a space gun ban in town records, but she wonders if it might have something to do with plans for a giant anti-ballistic missile site in North Andover that met with widespread opposition back in the 60s. What would that scare have been and was this, I mean, something that adults were concerned about? We're starting to think this is a cautionary tale about the unreliable echo chamber of the internet, when, deep in our research, we stumble on a short United Press item from 1954 that shows up in various forms in newspapers across the country. And that leads us to The Jackpot, a full-length Boston Globe article telling the dramatic tale of sparks from a toy gun burning a hole in a baby's snowsuit. So once you told me, I Googled it, and I was quite surprised. Um, I, you know, I did not know we had a history of not being space gun friendly. North Andover town manager Melissa Rodriguez asked her police and fire chiefs about space guns, and they looked at her funny. She says the ban was likely an informal directive from the fire chief to local toy stores. I do not have any evidence that that edict still exists. So our local businesses are welcome to sell any non-dangerous <laughs> space guns if they want to. 
Meanwhile, back in Marlboro, it may be time for another crackdown on the local toy stores. Illicit contraband appears to be making its way back onto shelves. And back to Plymouth, Patuxet. The name was changed in 2020 from Plymouth Plantation to better reflect the story that the Living History Museum wants to tell. The directors felt it was important to put the Wampanoag experience alongside that of the English settlers. The museum reopens for the season in April and will be celebrating 75 years of living history this year. Up next, watch out for the wine police.